There are a number of steps required in preparing a model for making a silicone blanket mold. After you have properly placed the model on the modeling board, make certain you have enough room all the way around for working. Michael likes to outline the model before he begins the molding process. The next step is to secure the model to the model board using the glue gun. After the model is fastened to the base, we use a non-sulfur clay for filling in any gaps between the model and the molding board. This is very important for producing a high quality silicone mold. Work your clay all the way around the base of the model and then clean it up using various tools. Take your time here in filling the gap. This is what's going to be produced in the final mold. Only use as much clay as is necessary to fill in the gaps. The next step is to seal the model with a clear acrylic sealer. We begin gluing down our cardboard strips around the edge of the model. This acts as a dam to prevent the silicone from flowing off the molding board. Make certain you use enough glue to seal it all the way around. You don't want any leaks. Michael usually makes is cardboard strips about an inch high. And after the model has been sealed to the board and the cardboard strips glued in place, he then uses a wax-based mold release to allow for an easier release from the silicone from the model. Now mold release is not usually necessary with silicone, but it does aid in the release. Next we prepare our rubber for applying to the model using a digital scale to weigh it out accurately and measure the amount of silicon required. In addition, we're using a fast catalyst here. This allows the mold to set more quickly. The fast catalyst does not reduce the properties of the silicone. It merely reduces the required time between coats of rubber. Thorough mixing is very critical. Take your time. Scrape the sides. Mix it well. We are now ready to apply the first coat of silicone. This is called the print coat. Take your time with this coat of rubber making sure you cover the model completely and fill in all the detail. This coat of rubber prints the surface of the model onto your silicone mold and thus prints it onto every casting that you produce. Again, take your time. Make certain you cover everything. After you've applied the print coat, you may use a hair dryer to burst any bubbles in the surface. A heat gun may be used as well. And after you've given the print coat sufficient time to dry according to the manufactured recommendations, as soon as it reaches a semi-tack stage where it barely comes off your glove, you are ready for the next coat. We are now ready to mix up our second coat of silicone and to add silicone pigment. The reason we are going to add silicone pigment to the mix is that it allows us to tell the difference between the two coats. Using this technique, 
You can tell where your first coat ends and your second coat begins. We use a powder thickener additive for thickening the second coat. You want it to be a cake batter consistency, allowing you to provide a thorough coating of the model. When you add your catalyst to the thickened silicone, remember you are adding the catalyst according to the weight of the original silicone, not to the weight of the silicone with the thickening agent mixed in. Take your time, mix thoroughly. The mixing must be complete and thorough so that the catalyst allows the silicone to do its job. As you can see here, our second coat of silicone has been thickened to a cake batter consistency. You must now take your time applying it over the model, covering all the surfaces. Due to the color differences between the first and the second coat, you'll be able to clearly see where you have missed. Make certain you mix enough silicone to cover the entire model. After you've finished applying the second coat of silicone, you again may use a heat gun for bursting any bubbles in the surface. Don't put it in too close to the surface and keep the heat gun moving around as you don't want to cook the rubber. A very important step in the process of silicone mold making is using denatured alcohol as a smoothing agent for smoothing out your silicone rubber. This works incredibly well. After you've poured your silicone base into your mixing bucket, the next step is to pigment this coat of rubber. This time we're going to use a different color for the third coat so that we can differentiate between the second and third coats. This will make your life much easier when applying your silicone rubber. As in the second coat, we add our powdered thixotropic agent to our silicone base rubber after it's been pigmented. Thorough mixing is very critical here as you are adding a lot of thickening agent to produce a very thixotropic coat. When adding the catalyst, make sure it is weighed out properly. When you mix the silicone rubber with your thickening agent, and your catalyst, you need to thoroughly mix all of the ingredients. Scraping the sides and the bottom is a very good technique for ensuring a thorough blending of rubber with the catalyst once it has been thickened. Your third coat of rubber is your thickest coat. This will allow you to complete the mold rather quickly and not require you to apply any more coats of rubber. Again, following the techniques used in the first two coats, your job is to get the rubber everywhere. Take your time, make sure everything is covered, and check all the little crevices and undercuts. When you're smoothing the final coat of rubber, you want to make sure you get the rubber nice and even, filling in everywhere. The alcohol will allow you to work it into place without it sticking to your gloves. Create a nice molded surface for your shell mold to rest on. As long as you keep wetting your hands with a denatured alcohol, you'll be able to work the rubber like soft clay. As we mentioned earlier, this is going to be a silicone blanket mold with a plaster shell. 
To save on the amount of rubber used in the construction of this mold, we'll be using plaster plugs made of castrite to fill in the gaps. We mix the castrite in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. In addition, we add nylon fiber for strength. This will make your plugs last a long time, which is critical in a mold that will be used over and over again. Once the castrite has reached a thickened state, you can begin building your plugs. Make certain your plugs have a draft angle on them so you'll be able to demold them from the shell easily. Clean the plugs up after they've dried so you have a smooth layer of surface when you build your next layer of the shell. Modeling clay is used for filling in any indentations or rough spots which may trap the shell and make it stick to the next coat of plaster. We use petroleum jelly for releasing the plaster plugs from the next layer of plaster. Make certain you get a thorough coating of petroleum jelly everywhere. Our next plugs will lock onto our first set of plugs. Again, because we have used petroleum jelly and modeling clay for filling in any undercuts, this plug should release easily. Modeling clay is used to fill in any of the undercuts in the shell plugs, as we do not want locking between the plugs and the final shell. A final coat of petroleum jelly is then applied to all the plugs before we begin construction of the outer shell. The final plaster shell is made by using the same technique as we did for making the plugs. We reinforce our castrite with fiber, applying it in a thickened state all over the mold and the existing plugs. After we applied a nice thick layer of castrite as an additional reinforcement, Michael uses plaster bandages around the shell to really give it additional strength. You'll want this mold to last a long time and to be reusable over and over again. So be generous with the plaster bandages. Using nylon fibers as well as plaster bandages in the final shell molding process will keep your shell thinner and lighter. If we've done a good job in our mold making process of releasing our plaster, then the mold should disassemble rather easily. Using a screwdriver and a putty knife, it's not that difficult to demold the model. As you can see, the castrite has been sufficiently released from the silicone and there's been no undercuts. So the rubber mold pulls out easily because we've used sufficient release on our plaster plugs they easily remove from over the shell. This will make your life much easier in the assembly and disassembly of the mold. Using a plaster rasp, we clean up the edges of the plaster plugs. These little thin areas would easily break in the casting process, so they should be removed. After we've cleaned up our shell components, we mark each piece with a number so that we know where to replace them. We are now ready to demold the model. It's very important that you take your time in this step, working your rubber around the model all around the little details. Remember that your rubber sticks into every nook and cranny on the model. So you really have to take your time working it gently with your fingers, almost massaging the rubber off the physical model. Don't rush things, it will come off as you can see.
To make the castings more easy to remove from the mold, you can put a couple of slits into the silicone rubber, not going too deeply so that we can remove the casting from the mold without tearing the rubber. We reassemble the mold and are now ready to make a casting.